Hey there, South Rock. I'm excited to see you yet again. All right, students, I uh, hope that this finds you almost done with school or, uh, you know, you are done now celebrating, so glad for that. Hey, I want you to think through a couple things here at the beginning. Have you ever been part of one of those times where you were in a group and you were playing some kind of sport and they divided up two teams and you were the last one chosen? Or maybe there was even an odd number and so they looked at you and said, yeah, you can't play. I remember a couple of those playing basketball in elementary school that I was the last one chosen. Uh, and so I remember those feelings. Or maybe it's not that. Maybe you've played a game like Duck, Duck, Goose. And, you know, everyone goes around Duck, 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 Goose. And when they hit Goose, you get to run around. But maybe you're one of them that you're a duck every single time. They never choose you to be Goose. And the game's not that much fun. Or I want you to think about moments where maybe you worked really hard, maybe studying for a test or working on a project or even practicing to get good at, you know, a musical instrument or vocals or even a sport. And then you get a performance or a test or something and you do really well and uh, you get a lot of praise for it. But in doing so, some other people don't like that you're getting that praise. Like even though you worked hard for it, like they don't like that. They're jealous. I also want you to think about what about in one of those moments, maybe those kids or, or adults are making fun of you or putting you down and you have the opportunity to get back at them. Do you take that moment? All those things are something that's going to show up in our lesson today. As we're looking at David, and there's a bunch of curveballs in his life, and if you were to ask people about the main instances, the main events about David, almost everyone would tell you about David and Goliath. I mean, even people who necessarily don't know much about the Bible would tell you, man, here's an underdog story, you know, a David versus Goliath. And so they'd tell you those kind of things. Um, you also would have people tell you about Bathsheba, knowing that, yeah, he, create, he committed adultery, and in doing so, you know, that really did wreck his family and things like that. And some of them know the rest of the story, some of them don't. But those are some main things that happen in the life of David. I want to look at three other events that are kind of smaller, less known events, even though a lot of people still know them. But look at these curveballs and how does David respond? Okay, the first one, I want you to imagine that at this moment, Saul is the first king of Israel. Okay, Israel's had their first king named Saul, but he chooses to do something that he's not supposed to. And God says, you're not going to be king anymore. And so Samuel is a prophet at that time. And God uses him and says, I'm going to have you go anoint the next king of Israel. But you don't know who it is. And so Samuel obeys and he follows until he stops where God sends him. And he sees this man named Jesse and says, I want you to prepare your sons and bring them to the ceremony. And so they go and get ready and so while they're there, his oldest son, Eliab, you know, is there. And, and Samuel's thinking, that's got to be the king. But in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, says, The Lord said to Samuel, do not consider him, for I have not, or, you know, do not look at his height or appearance, for I have not considered him. Like the Lord does not look at the things man looks at. The Lord, or man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Like that's what 1 Samuel 16, 7 says. It says that's not the king. And so all the sons of Jesse go right before Samuel, and none of them are the one that God says, that's the king. And so Samuel looks at Jesse and says, do you have any more sons? He says, I do. Um, he's out in the, in the fields watching the sheep. And so they said, well, hurry, go get him. And David is brought before Samuel and he's anointed king. Now, if you want to talk about curveballs, it's just a day like any other day, kind of like we talked about last week with Elijah. And he's been watching the sheep and all of a sudden you are told that you're going to be the next king of Israel. You know, that's a pretty magnificent kind of curveball if I, if I think about it. The second thing I would tell you is we're going to fast forward a little bit, and David has already killed Goliath. Well, Saul then keeps him living at the, at the palace, doesn't send him home with his dad. Well, during this time, he also begins to give him more projects because he sees that, you know, everything that David does is successful. In fact, uh, 1 Samuel 18.5 says that. And so Saul puts him as head of the army and things like that. He's also become really good uh, friends with his son. And so Saul sees all these things. Well, one time on the way back from a victory, the people are praising David. They say, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. And man, Saul does not like it. He is full of jealousy. And so maybe he was part of like track and field and threw the javelin or something. But in the palace, when David is playing the harp, he gets angry like David, or not David, but Saul gets angry and he throws a spear at David and he misses. Well, he does it again, throws it a second time at David and he still misses like David's able to elude him. Well, then in chapter 19, we read that it happens a third time. Like I know the saying that says, you know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me one, twice, shame on me. They don't even have a third one. It's like fool me three times, crazy. I mean, because you shouldn't be, you know, uh, tricked three different times. And yet David, after that, he's like, I got to get out of here. And so again, looking at, at David, here's a guy who has saved Israel and he's obeying the king, doing the things that he's supposed to do. And yet because the king is jealous, he tries to kill him. 
That's quite the curveball. The third thing is I want to fast forward just a little bit more, all right? And in this moment, David has been running away from Saul. He's got some of his men and they're hiding out because Saul continues trying to chase him. And in fact, one time Saul hears, hey, David and his men are in this desert not too far away. And so Saul takes 3,000 men with him and they're going to go catch David and try and kill him. Well, in this moment, David and his men are hiding out because he knows that Saul is close and Saul really needs to go to the bathroom. And he needs to go to number two. And because he wants some privacy, he's the king. You know, people see him with royalty. He goes into this cave to go use the restroom in there. And it's the exact cave that David and his men are hiding at farther back. And David's men are like, look, this is the opportunity. God has said, you're going to be the next king. He is handing over your enemy to you. Go and kill him right now. And David sneaks up next to Saul and he actually cuts off a corner of his cloak. But then he feels guilty about that and he goes back and he waits till Saul leaves the cave. But he looks at his men and he says, you know what? God is the one who anointed Saul as king. It is not my role to take him out. And so after Saul has left the cave and gone far away, uh, David comes out and he yells down to Saul. And he says, Saul, why do you keep chasing me? Why do you think that I am trying to kill you? And he holds up the corner of his cloak and says, look, I had the opportunity to kill you, but I chose not to. And Saul says, you are a better man than I am. And so he leaves David alone, at least for a while. Then we read another time where he comes chasing him again, and David has another chance to kill Saul, but he doesn't do it. And if you're talking about curveballs, you have been running for your life, okay? Not just a game of tag or hide and seek, like trying not to get caught because you will be killed. And here is the one who is trying to kill you right in front of you, and you have the opportunity, and yet you choose not to. Like that's what David did, this curveball in the moment that I've got the upper hand, and yet he chooses not to take advantage of that. You know, here's some things that I'd love for you to think about as we just looked at those three curveballs. You know, how do you think that it would have been like being David told that, man, you're going to be the next king. Like sometimes we talk about curveballs in life and we think that they're only negative. But sometimes there are positive curveballs that come that we weren't expecting. And in those positive things, we can give praise to God, but also look at see how God may want to use you in those moments. I would tell you with that second curveball, sometimes we feel jealous of other people. Like we want the praise at the moment. We don't like seeing it when other people get it, like especially if we've worked hard. Or sometimes if we haven't worked hard at all, we get especially jealous. Well, someone else shouldn't deserve that. So we need to watch our own attitudes and pray, asking God, help our hearts not to be ones that we become jealous of other people. Because you can tell certain people, jealousy can rule your heart and it ruins your life. So be careful of that. The last thing I would tell you to do is no matter how other people treat you, we should still choose to do the right thing. Like David, you know, Saul did not treat him the right way, and yet he still chose to treat him with respect as the authority. And there are going to be times that people put you down or make fun of you or whatever, even when you're doing the right thing. And yet, may you hold on to God's spirit tightly going, you know what? Jesus is the example. Like people didn't always treat him the way that he was supposed to be treated, and he still treated them with respect and love and care and gave them forgiveness on the cross. And so I should live that way too. So sometimes there are going to be good curveballs this week. Keep your eyes open for those and let God use you in those ways. Don't let jealousy overtake you. And if you're struggling with jealousy in some area, why don't you pray to God and have him help you with that? And then uh, the last thing, choose to do the right thing, even when other people may not be. Be that man or woman of integrity. And in telling you all these things, I'm looking forward to seeing you hopefully in a few weeks. Uh, until then, keep on living for God amongst the curveballs in life. See you later, students.